Amen. So turn me over to Acts chapter 2. Um, I know this, this, this title doesn't sound like we're talking about prayer, but prayer is very much an emphasis in this message. But the title of the message, and I like to give in titles, I know a lot of pastors don't, but it helps me keep track of what I'm doing. So it's the, the title is The Purpose of the Church. And uh, I'm going to read out of, uh, I'm going to read out of the Passion, this verse, out of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I love this version of the, the, the Passion. If you got uh, Olive Tree on your phone or on your computer, I encourage you to download that because it really says, it says things really in a really uh, good way. Every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. So what does it say up there? It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Um, what is the church? Now I know, we know, you know, that this, not, this building is not the church. Okay, it, uh, This building is a building where we come. The building is all over down Queenwood and, uh, and on out. There's about four churches that we all sort of share the same vicinity within a couple three miles apart but that's not the church that building those buildings are not the church what is the church the church is not a place for um but it, yet it is for a social gathering it's not what it is but it is for that we have that ability uh, what is the church it's not a place that necessarily um provides food for the hungry, although it does, okay? I'm not saying, but it's not the purpose, I don't believe. I and mean, the purpose is going to be, I believe it's deeper than that. And in order to do all those things, in order to have an, a building, in order to, somebody's out scabbing there, Hank, there's a tow truck out there. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I saw the tow truck and I thought, oh, never mind. <laughs> but the the purpose of the church is, I believe, it's fivefold. I'm going to say five different things. I believe it's the reason why it's there. Turn over to Mark uh, chapter 11, verse 17. Um, and I believe it's a place of prayer. We've talked about this. We want to keep pounding this and pounding this and pounding this. And it's not that I don't believe you don't know that. It's that the more we talk about it, the more it's instilled in us of what it is. It says, Then he taught, saying to them, it is, is it not written, My house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations? And we'll just stop right there. For all the, is it not written that my, church, my house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations? In other words, he's not just talking here to the Jewish people. This is Jesus' words. He's not just talking to those that were of the lineage of Abraham. He's talking about everybody. He's talking about the need for us to get big. This is not just a house of prayer for us that come here. Okay? It's not just about we for and no more type of mentality in church. It needs to be outside the walls. The, the, it, this, what we get here needs to be taken outside the walls. It needs to be taken to Caterpillar. It needs to be taken to Parsons. It needs to be taken to, to Kankakee Hospital. It needs to be taken to, to uh, uh, Kiwani Area Postal. It needs to be going out further than this. And I do believe that every place where we are is an outreach. Every one of us is a ministry. Every one of us is, not all of us are preachers, not all of us are called the pulpit ministry, but every one of us, the word says that every one of us are a ministry person. We have an obligation according to the word. So it doesn't matter if you work at a hospital, it doesn't matter where you work, it doesn't matter if you drive somebody else's tow truck who's, never mind. And it was like, um, it, it's an outreach, okay? It is an outreach. And so we have to go to the nations, go to the world, okay? Mark chapter 1, verse 35. So that's a corporate prayer. Jesus is praying corporate prayer. He says, he says, my house needs to be called a house of prayer. Why? Because that's what we should do when we come. We should be unified in our prayer. And it doesn't mean just when we're here on Sunday mornings or just when we're here on Thursday nights. It means that any time we can, and that means Friday nights. One thing I did take note of is nobody texted me and said, hey, where's the prayer request tonight? Now that caught my, I caught my awareness today. I thought, you know what, I forgot, because I got busy with things, but nobody really cared. Because nobody said a word. Now, if you cared, and you didn't say a word, take it for what it is, you still didn't say a word. Nobody said, hey, where's my prayer request tonight? I want to be on top of it. Now I have to say this, Lori a couple, three weeks ago, said, hey, I only, I, I, 
was I supposed to get prayer requests tonight? Because I had missed her on the, li on the link somehow. But she caught me. And so it's like, so, I don't know where she was at this week. We said, hey, Pastor Bob, where's my prayer request? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> no guilt. <laughs> but, but I guess what I'm saying is, it's, it is all of our responsibility for that Friday night prayer. It's all of us saying, hey, I'm, I'm supposed to be praying at 8 o'clock tonight, and I have no idea what I'm supposed to be praying about. And so that's at that point where we all, I'm not trying to pick, well, yeah, I am too. Yeah. I, exactly. I already gave my, I already admitted my, pro, what I did, I already admitted my omission, but I'm just saying the rest of you weren't guiltless either, okay? Mark chapter 1, verse 35, we there, yeah. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, and I'm not sure that's even scriptural. I don't think that's, that's not even right. He went out and he departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. Um, I once wrote an article, I think it's actually my, I think I actually did the thing in my first book, uh, Devotions, talked about uh, P and P. <laughs> All right, never mind. Uh, but P and P, uh, what was it? Prayer and, um, I lost it now, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, Yeah, never mind. But is it, he, t he gives us an example that at times there's this singleness about our prayer. There's this need to get away by ourselves to where we focus, to where we can focus and, and, what, and what, what God wants us to pray about and what we need to speak to him about. So it's a personal time of prayer. It's a time where we can say, I'm shutting out the rest of the world. I'm shutting out my spouse. I'm shutting out my kids. I'm, I'm going to a secret place a prayer. That's what he said. He didn't take the disciples. They didn't follow. He got up before they were awake and snuck out the door. Okay. Now as teenagers, we remember trying to sneak out the door at times. <laughs> we started moving to a house in Washington. We moved back to, when we first moved back to Washington. Rob was in eighth grade, and we looked first how we looked at, house we looked at was right next to uh, Michael's uh, Italian feast place, right? It used to be called La Gondola, and the house had this bedroom down or a room downstairs with an outside door. Now Rob's whole thought was, I want that room. <laughs> now, <laughs> have, ha, having been a teenager myself, I'm thinking, I'm not giving you no doorway to nothing where I can't hear you coming and going, you know? And it's not that I didn't trust him. Well, that might have played part, but I mean, it's, 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 as I knew that if he had the opportunity, he might. And see, Jesus said when he could, when Jesus could, preparation and prayer was what I was talking about, because yeah. It was preparation prayer. Because I wrote the article because I had had a very busy week. And God reminded me of in the military, when you're in combat, you get R&R. &R. And R&R &R means rest and recuperation. Okay? It means you get away from the battle. You get away from the situation so you can get rejuvenated. And that's what that personal time of prayer is about. It's about rejuvenation. It's about getting yourself focused back to where now you can go back into the fray. Now you can go back and do what you're supposed to do. Why? Because you've got this cool, refreshing water of prayer that's just washed over you and your time with God. Matthew 18, verse... In the one you just Yeah, yeah, to give himself to prayer. I think that puts a whole other atmosphere that to give himself to prayer. Yes, yes, that's good. Thank you. I had... I, I, Shift it because I know we don't have the passion. We will have soon every version that I want to quote or anybody else wants to quote. They're going to be up there for they can just pop to it and go to that. Ver we just haven't got it over there yet. But, but that is to give them something. When I read that, that's the reason why I like the passion because it adds a little bit more emphasis. And it takes us to, to the point of going I, to give ourselves to prayer, to give ourselves because we need that time of recharge. You know, my watch, I love my Apple watch. Um, I love it. Some of us are lucky to have Apple Watches, huh, Carly? And some of us don't. Um, but uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I have to charge. I put it on the charger every night. I got a little thing that sits on there. I put it on the charge. Because if I try to wear it too long past the charge, all of a sudden I'll be walking along and it's not operating like it needs to operate. But it, it, that's, what, that's what prayer does for us. We take that time away by ourselves to give ourselves a prayer so that we might get re recharged, right? Get refreshed. Matthew chapter 18. Verses 18, I think I got 18, 19. I mean, I have both of them there, but Matthew chapter 18, 18 says this. This is an agreement prayer, okay? It says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything. Now, anything's a pretty broad term, isn't it? 
Is there anything that can't be accomplished according to this word if we agree? Not one thing. He goes, uh, and he, oh, I'm sorry, drop down to 19, Vince. I'm sorry, because I didn't start. Again, I say to you that if any, of you, any two of you agree on earth any, concerning anything that they ask, it will be done. It doesn't say it might be done, does it? It doesn't say, well, if I feel like it today, if I've not had a bad day, God's, God's not saying if I had a bad day, it might not get. He's saying if, he says, uh, again, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And so it's a matter of um, us understanding that God has a plan, but we have to ask. He wants to help us, but we have to go to him. And we want to go in agreement. That's why the circle prayer groups are important. Now, I'm I have challenged you, and I don't know if any of you have done this, I mean, it's on you as a group to get connected during these 40 days, to pray specifically for something in your group. You know, that goes along with the corporate prayer. But if you see something that someone, and we do a, when I don't forget, and you don't forget to remind me, just so we all bear the same burden here. Um, um, <laughs> I thought about that, Rob. I thought, well, I'm not going down alone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. You know, but the thing is, is that uh, if we, if, if um, we all sink or swim together, is what it says, right? Um, if, if, if in the circle, you see something that someone has asked for, a prayer group, prayer, uh, a prayer request on Friday night, and they're in your group, maybe you should call everybody in your group or text everybody. You don't have to call. Text everybody in your group. Okay, let's pray about this again. Let's pray about it in agreement as a circle group. They, they, it wasn't just something we wanted to do just to say we did it. It's something that should be ongoing, penetrating all the time, the, he the, the heavenlies. Amen? And then there's the next one in Jude, chap uh, Jude. there's only one chapter, but in Jude 20, verses 20 through 21, it's, called, it's a personal strength prayer. He says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping ourselves in the love of God, looking for uh, the mercy of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, Praying in the Holy Spirit, that means, that means that's a whole other realm, isn't it? It's a whole other place to be at. And if you've not gotten that yet, if you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's plenty of people have around here that have been. That, and it's not something to be scared about. It's not something, I mean, when Jesus is, and, and, and Paul have talked about it, the, 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 the need for getting the Holy Spirit moving in you, then it's a time to, for us to take, take note of it. You know, um, I have a quote here. It says that God's dream for your life is much bigger and so uh, is so much bigger, so much better than um, just breaking even. So to get to that level of not breaking even, you know, it's like God wants us excelling. He wants us out there doing our best to get closer and closer and closer to the call that's on our lives. And again, I can't say this enough. Every one of you have a call in your life. Not everyone is going to be behind this pulpit. First of all, my responsibility is to make sure that, and, I, and please don't take this wrong. Those of you who aspire to it, then keep aspiring. If God's tugging on your heart, then let him keep tugging. But, but, but put yourself, study yourself to be approved, the word says. You know? And I've, 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 I've dropped in, uh, uh, in my time in ministry, and when I first started off, I've, I've, I've dropped enough bombs preaching as anybody. But I'm telling you is that you have to prepare yourself to do this, okay? When I ask one of the guys, and that's the reason, I mean, everyone in this room that has, I'll t let me take the little weight off of you this week. If you haven't ever preached before, I'm not going to contact you Saturday. Oh, come on. <laughs> I said, if you've never preached before, Ashley, you're off the hook. Because I want to be here the day that the quickening comes on you. <laughs> so I'm not saying it's never happening. I'm just saying it's not happening this next Sunday. Okay. But what I'm saying is I want to make, I, my, my responsibility is to make sure that someone is, is, is and again, I want to preface, please don't get mad at me, when I say, that is prepared to deliver on a Sunday morning. Okay. It's because it's important that it's a strong word. Because we, we, we've got guys and gals in this room that are powerful preachers. Now, I did, remember what I did say, that's never preached before. That leaves a whole lot of room in here, okay? The thing is, is that 
we have a need to exercise our gifts. But not everybody's a pulpit minister. Not everybody's going to get up here and preach. I'm not going to do that, okay? Maybe the exception of Ashley. But everybody's got, not everybody's going to get up here and preach. But also, the key is, is that you still have a responsibility to the ministry. Right. You have a responsibility to this ministry. That's why you're here. We had a school. Many of you that have been with us since the beginning have a degree that you got on your wall or stuck in a drawer somewhere, and you did it, not just so you could do it, you did it to prepare yourself for your part of the ministry of this church. To build this church up, to strengthen, the, to build the church out there up, not to get great numbers in this building, but to make sure that when we go out of this building, you were prepared to do what you're called to do. Okay? So don't get quaking and shaking every time I say, but you know, but I'm encouraged when I hear people get up here that get up here and, and do something. And, and I'm encouraged because why? My job as the pastor of this church, my number one job is not to deliver a earth-shaking message every Sunday. But my number one job is to train you to do that. My number one job is for you to be trained to go out and make an earth-shaking message out there where you live. That's my number one job. Now, I do my best to bring a, a, a fresh message every week. I haven't, I've got thousands of messages I can go back to. I don't I've never, think I've ever done that. A lot of reasons because I don't keep real good records. They're all back there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't preached that in a long time, but since you brought it up, we'll turn there. No, I'm just teasing. Yeah. But there was one that I preached over and over and over again. But I don't try to do that. Why? Because I'm trying to make sure that we get a fresh word. Now, it doesn't mean I don't say the same thing sometimes. It doesn't mean that I don't get up here and hear uh, Aaron preach something. Man, I want to preach that too. And it's not that I could do any better, but I want, I, it touched me. And now I want, to, I want to share what it touched me about. And that's what the ministry is about, beloved. You realize there is nothing new under heaven. There's nothing out there that nobody else hasn't already done or said or heard. Nothing. It's just how we say it, what emphasis we put on it with our life, and that's what it is. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm amazed when I go to Kentucky at the connection of what we teach here and what they teach there without me communicating with them, without me under, never watching whatever they do or whatever, or, or whatever. It's because God's Spirit is moving in the body. So there's going to be times. And that's where, in this right here, this personal strength in Jude 2021 20, will give you the ability, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're called to do, to get up and do it. It's not easy every Sunday. Is it, Aaron? Oh, here comes Deb. <laughs> Maybe it's easier for her. <laughs> Let me finish my thought. It's not easy every Sunday, is it, Jeff, to get up here and do that. It's not easy, Gail, to get up here all of a sudden and do that. Right? It's not easy. But the key is, is when you've personally strengthened yourself in prayer, God has a dream for your life that's mu so much bigger and so much better than just breaking even. Go ahead. I just, I, when you said that, it, it touched me because something I read just recently about our individual gifts and how we, uh, you, know, you know, how we bring forth things. Do you realize that Luke is the only one of the gospel writers that shared about when Peter cut off Malchus' ear? You know, Luke is the one that shared how he healed it. Guess what? Luke was the physician. He saw things through a physician's eyes. He understood, you know, that a physician, you know, all those things. So he would, everything he saw and did was taint, not tainted, but influenced by his background. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to realize that our gifts are unique to each one of us, and we are to use those gifts to bring forth the gospel. Just like Luke brought forth that one little detail that none of the other writers brought forth because he was a doctor. And so he was the one that talked about Jesus healed it, put it back on there and healed it because he was a doctor. What was that, Jeff? <laughs> I thought he was healing back there. He's going. <laughs> See, eyes are always on you. <laughs> I take notes in any, in anybody that preaches. Sometimes I take very copious notes. Sometimes I just write down the scriptures. But when I'm writing down the scriptures, it doesn't mean that I'm not going, uh, that I'm, I'm, what it does for me is I go back to it. Because a lot of times I hear somebody preach and I go, wow, that's really, a, that's a great message, but I'd like to go back and explore it a little deeper. Plus, it's something that just 
spoke to my spirit that that I I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, you know, you could get you could get Jeff up here or Aaron up here, or Rob up here, Vince, any Joe, any of them to get up here. It's in their flavors. And the thing is, is it doesn't mean that it's not going to touch my flavor to where I have a, 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 a thought process on it or, or an ability to speak it out. Pastor Callahan, back when we first joined his organization, every week would send out to all the pastors in his organization the three messages that he preached that week, the Sunday morning, Sunday night, and the Wednesday night. We would get them on cassette every week. And it wasn't that he was saying preach my messages, but he was feeding his pastors because his responsibility was to feed his immediate sheep and that his pastors were part of that. But there was many times we'd read, I'd listen to those messages. I'd go, wow, that, that'll preach. That will preach. There's another message I love preaching on. And I have used the illustration many times as the value of the dry bones. When I first heard that message, when it first spoke to my heart, was uh, a friend of mine, Richie Denning, had says, hey, hey, Bob, you need, to, you need to listen to this. I think you can preach this, okay? And so I thought, okay, I'm out mowing the yard one day, got my old walk band on my hip. You know, that tells you how long ago it was. And I'm listening to this tape. And I'm, I'm mowing the yard. I, I, can, I, I can visualize where I was at when it just started speaking to my spirit. And I'm out mowing the front yard. And, I'm, and it's like, oh, I'm getting excited. I think, man, I can preach this message. And I have several times in my flavor. And each time I preached it, it's been a little bit different take on it, okay? And so the key is, is that it's that because of that personal time of prayer that you spend in preparation that allows you to see and hear things differently than you did the time before. You know, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Rejoice always. And verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. Now let's reverse that. Because I believe the only way you can rejoice always now, when Paul wrote it, he wrote it in the way it came out. But if you look at it, if you reverse it, say, pray without ceasing, then you can rejoice always. Because you're not carrying a burden anymore. You're not carrying a struggle anymore. If you're praying as the Word tells us to pray in, in, in corporate prayer, in agreement prayer, in, in our, our individual prayer, we can now let the burden lift off us and we have the ability to rejoice. We have the ability to look at things different because prayer is what changes the things in our lives. It changes us. It causes us to look at situations differently. As we pray, we need to believe that God is going to do something supernatural in us and through us. In us first and then through us. The only way he can get it through us is to get it in us. And so when we pray, we have to go into that prayer. That's exactly what it says in Mark 11 when he says, When you pray, believe that you've received, and you say unto this mountain, Be thou cast into the sea, it has to be uprooted and be done. Amen? I know they've just twisted a couple of scriptures there together because you can't uproot a mountain. You just tear it out of the ground. It's a tree that you uproot and put in the middle of the sea. Okay, I understand all that. I understand all that. The key is, is that what he's saying here, we have to look at when we pray that it's being done. It's being done first in us and then through us. And then the best way to get vindication on what the devil, on the devil, is to pray. Debbie was talking in... in, in uh, foundations this morning um i turned a couple of female clients over to her <laughs> it was fun it was great <laughs> and 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 um one was easier than the other although both they both have similar situations but one was more receptive than the other and to debbie's ministry to what debbie was saying yeah i know i know i'm not gonna say nothing this is gonna i understand no i'm gonna say it to where doesn't matter. But those two situations, we're going to have a different outcome if they don't both go the way that Debbie counseled them. They're both going to have uh, an outcome, but they're both going to be different. One will be productive, one won't. But it's a matter of getting rid of what the devil's trying to put in your midst of your life. This is what the quote says. It says, the best way to get vindication. Vindication is a, an act of unforgiveness. When you say, I need to be vindicated, I need to get, that person needs to pay for what they just did to me. That's unforgiveness. And the word says that if you allow unforgiveness to take root in your system, you're the one that's going to have the problem, not them. Because if I make Aaron mad, you know, I pick on his wife all the time. I'm going to pick on her, she's not even here. No. But if, if, if you know, being, and, and as much as he loves her, he could say, you know, I'm tired of that, Pastor. He may have, may, he may have I don't know. <laughs> And they go, but a lot of times he's going, yes, yes, yes. 
But I mean, the thing is, if he decided to let something I said that, that he, and, and take offense, there's the first part, to take offense, and then to allow the offense to root into unforgiveness, and then to not treat either one of those symptoms, because those are symptoms of a root system of bitterness. Those are the outward signs that something's working in us that's wrong. I love it. I think it was Danita or Dean. I don't forget which one of them was. I said, I said, I went into, I think it was Dina. I went into her shop one day and I said, said something in here and I thought, oh, I shouldn't have said it like that. But that's not, un, that's not un, unusual, right? Um, I shouldn't have said it like that. So I went in the shop one day. I said, you know, Dina, I apologize. I hope I didn't offend you. She said, you can't offend me. That's a choice that she's made. That's a choice. And because I give her ample opportunities. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is that, uh, if you haven't been offended by me, you haven't been in the church long enough, okay? <laughs> the thing is, is that we have to realize that when we say we want to get vengeance on somebody, let me fin I'll, fin I'll finish the, the statement here, then we're, we're, we're allowing ourselves, we're putting ourselves in a position for us to be damaged, us to be hurt. And that includes the devil. It says the best way to get vindication on the devil is to pray and make the devil sorry that he ever attacked you or your family. You sick heaven on him and he's got to go. When you say, I am, the, I stand by the authority of Jesus Christ, and you got to go. You can't stay. You can't do this to me or my family. You have to go, okay? And, and now stop, let, let's give him a little bit of credit. He's not responsible for a lot of things we get ourselves into, okay? He, we, we give him all the, all the, let's give him all the credit that he's due, but let's not give him so much when we're really just us screwing up, okay? But he doesn't have any, he can't stay. We don't have to get any, we don't have to seek any vengeance beyond the fact that we pray and we seek, we seek heaven on him. Amen? Um, so the first, first part of this was, um, the, the church is a place of prayer. The second one is, the, it is a place of partnership. Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. Um, and it's because I like the way it reads, and I'll go back to what he's going to put up. But First Corinthians chapter, I mean, Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses thirteen and fourteen. As a result of your ministry, say as a result of my ministry, they will give glory to God. So when when we seek glory on our own and we're just doing what God's telling us to do, we're wrong. Okay, when we try to get a build a big name for ourselves, then we're wrong. It's not about us. Say it's not about me. It's only what God's working through me. That's what it's about. It's about God working through me. <laughs> um, your generosity, don't have to repeat, your generosity to, to them and all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. In other words, he's saying, for I do not mean that others should be, e be eased and... And you burdened. Okay, go on. But by an equality that now is at time, at, at this time, your abundance may supply their, supply their lack. That their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. Now, we live in a world that everything, everybody wants to be equal. We're not equal. Dan is a whole lot taller than me. And he's younger. We're not equal. I'm a whole lot better looking than Rick. We're not equal. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know I can pick on him. He's, he's like, well, I know what he I've heard that before. I know it ain't true. Just ask my wife. <laughs> Thing is, is that I'm weak. we're not equal, right? Hank loves snow. Not me. We're not equal. Jeff and Rob can get up here and preach the socks off of creation stuff. I can't. I'm, 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 I can't do that. I don't, that's not my wheelhouse, as it were. Aaron gets up here and just delivers. He waxes eloquently in an area that Aaron does. Same with Pastor Joe. I get, I get ministered to by them. Why? Because they're, all, when, they're not equal. They're all pastors. They're all preachers. They're all very good. Vince gets up here. What a dynamic teacher. Gets up here and just pounds and pounds. Those guys can just do, you know, and I know it seems like I leave Danny out a lot. I don't mean to. Danny's got a unique gift that's specific to Danny. When I say, he'll, he'll say, I'll say, hey, can I, can we get that? He's, yeah, we'll get that done. I, I have to say it one time. And Danny's like, he's like, he's like a, a f 
<laughs> you only have to mention I only have to mention one thing to Danny one time and it's done I don't have to I can walk away and I don't have to worry about it that's a unique gift that's an area of pastoring that's not seen because it's, be, it's out there in a situation where he's not in front of people but he's doing the work of the ministry that is powerful okay and see the, the key is and, and every one of them are unique. They're all pastors, but they all have a unique gift. We're all the, we're all all similar, but we have different things. But the thing is, is there is equality. It brings equality when we all come together like a wheel on on a, on a gear. When we all click together, all of a sudden, now it is equality. Because without the other, we don't function well. Without the other, we don't move. Because there's a partnership. There's a it, it it's a place of partnership. The church is a place of partnership. Galatians chapter 5 verse 14 and says, um, I'm going to read out the New uh, Living Translation again. It says, for the whole law can be summed up in this command, love your neighbor as yourself. And verse 15 says, but if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. Watch out. Because you start picking each other, you start... Uh, uh, not picking. You start. You start uh, degrading each other. You start uh, demoting. You you want to raise yourself up above above the others, because you think your gift is greater. Nobody's gift in here is greater than the other. We each have a responsibility. I get this responsibility, but it's not greater. I get this responsibility. You know, Gail gets responsibility base. That's not greater. It's just her responsibility. It's what her. It's what God's called her to do. It doesn't make her better in the kingdom. It doesn't make. Um, we lost Billy Graham this last week. Is that right? Just last week, and I and I was sitting there. I'm 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 sitting there reading some stuff about him, and I'm amazed. He 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 preached to two over 215 million people. I think it counted like uh, from it was from Truman to uh, basically Trump, as far as, as as presidency. He he touched lives on all the people. And I'm thinking, and then I started thinking about my grandma. My grandma didn't go to church a lot. My mom's mom. But my grandma loved God. But she watched. Every time Billy Graham was on TV, she's watching Billy Graham. Every time Oral Roberts is on TV, she's watching Oral Roberts. I remember those. I remember the, 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 the weather commanding presence on national TV. Billy Graham, he'd get on. I don't know what network was on, but he'd, he'd command a whole week at a time on network TV. And I think about the lives that were affected in the first generation. I think it was in the 50s. 57 was when he first broke through i think about those lives then that generation there then the next generation and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, and then the offshoots to friends neighbors that because he touched that person's life now all of a sudden the connection and i, th I thought about what a powerful ministry that guy had but it wasn't any more unequal than yours you have the same ability what was the difference between Billy Graham and us? It's Billy Graham stepped out, trusted God, and did the work. He didn't question it. As a matter of fact, I, I read a quote about him. But one of the last times he was in the hospital, he said, he says, I, well, no, I, I, it was not. He says, I'm not going to heaven. This is a quote he said. I'm not going to heaven because I preached to great crowds. He said, I'm not going to heaven because I read the Bible many times. I'm going to heaven just like the thief on the cross who said in the last moment, Lord, remember me. There was a humbleness about him that kept him going and moving and driving further into the kingdom so that he could touch as many lives as possible. That's what, that's what it's talking about, partnership here. People partnered with him because he was their arms and their legs and their voice, but they were just as equal in. But they, they give the material, pass out the material. They give the material out. He was a forerunner of so many things, but the key is, is that he left behind a legacy in you and me. He left it. Whether you ever listen to any of his messages or not, he left behind a legacy in you. Because one of us, somewhere along the line, somebody that you, is in your generation, somebody that you know was touched by his ministry. And so you have been ministered to by him in, 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 a, in, a, in a way. Philippians chapter 1 verse 5 says this, For you have been my partners in spreading the gospel, the good news about Christ from the time you first heard until now. Paul is saying to the Philippian church, look, you've been my partners. I'm doing what I'm doing because you're doing what you're doing. 
You're not out there, you, you know. Paul's ministry was not fun. I mean, it wasn't glamorous. He gets stoned nearly to death. Got beat several times with, 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 with whips. He got cast out of towns. His men, he was thrown in dungeons. Not, 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 not our, our cush prisons, dungeons. Places where uh, 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 human waste was floating by him. And I got to tell you, I was in the military. And I remember latrines. They were not fun. And I remember, you know, it's like you go into a bathroom with somebody and, it, and they've just done what they need to do. It's not fun. You go and hold your breath. You go, like this or whatever, you know. <laughs> I do. I don't know about you. I can't. But he's in that type of prison. Now, you guys came here for the color commentary, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, that was good, too. Uh, it's like, the thing is, is he was in prisons that that stuff floated by. I, at least I don't say things like Rob does. You know, the thing is, is, is he's, that's, and Jeff, Jeff's gotten just as bad. They've been hanging out too much. It's like, they've got, and, and, but yet, but he kept moving forward. He kept punishing the enemy. He kept punishing the enemy so that he could get the gospel out. We need to get up every morning, and you've heard this phrase before, get up, and when we put our feet on the ground, the devil and all of hell needs to shake because you just woke up. Because when you put your feet on the ground, you have such authority that it resonates, it earthquakes hell. When that happens, we are, we are going where we're supposed to go. We're doing what we're supposed to do. Um, remember this, God's dream for your life is so much bigger, so much better than just breaking even. Now, you could go through life and just break even. What's that mean? You get born... You live your life, you go, you're good at your good job, you're good at your job, you do this, you provide for your family, and you die. I don't want to do that. I want hell to shake. I want heaven to rejoice. I want to do things not for my glory, but for the glory of God. I want to uh, I want people to, as as I sat there this 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 past week thinking and reading about Billy Graham. I, and, and I know because I, 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 he wasn't doing it for Billy Graham. He wasn't doing it for his name being out there. But I want to be, I want to be like that. That when I'm gone, people say, "I'm glad he lived." That's not breaking even, people. That's not breaking even. That's being so much bigger and so much better. That's God's dream for you and I. Amen. The third thing is, is the purpose of the church is burden bearing. Uh, in Galatians chapter six. Um, if you turn over to Galatians chapter 6, we're going to look at a couple of verses here. Um, if I can get there. In Galatians chapter 6, it's starting to read at verse 1. I guess I just have Vince put it up there and I can read it like the rest of it. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Let me just stop right there for a minute. Christians are the only ones that shoot their wounded. The church, religion, is the only organization that shoots its wounded. What do I mean by that? It's mean when somebody makes a mistake, instead of trying to restore them, it says, what does it say? You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of what? Gentleness. You, 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 you say, well then, when you see somebody that's fallen, you see somebody that's, that's hurting, somebody that you knew used to sit beside you in church, somebody you knew that used to walk with God, someone that you knew that used to have a, a walk with God and, and, and live for God, and they're not there anymore, our responsibility is to go them to them in a spirit of gentleness, a spirit of meekness, a spirit of res restoration. You can't restore somebody by kicking them in their teeth. You can't restore somebody by, well, you just screwed up now. You can't do that. He goes on to say this, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You know, when you are so quick to fix blame on everybody and not forgive them. There can come a day in your life where that will be reciprocated back to you. There can come a day in your life when what you sowed 
will be harvested in your own life. And, and then all of a sudden, you're going to need somebody else and they're not going to be there. Why? Because you sowed that seed. Now, we, we won't have that happen to anybody in here because we don't sow those seeds. The thing is, is that bear one another's burdens and also fulfill the, the, the law of, of uh, Christ. And then verses 3 through 5 says this, For if anyone thinks of himself to be something, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. That's basically saying if you've got this great big old ego, realize you're just like everybody else. You know, I think I've used this illustration before. Back when I was young and I was in business, um, my first guy of the army, had to wear suit and tie all the time. I was all excited about that. I had to wear suit and tie, look all cool. and I was thinner too, so it helped, you know. Uh, suits don't look that great on you when you're fat. But the thing is, is that... <clears throat> The thing is, is I was out there and I'd wear the suit and tie and I'd be all, go walk into places and you just like, you sort of strut in because you got the suit. It, may, it puts a different aura on you back then when I was young. And I remember, but I would see like somebody, I'd run across somebody like had old gray hair and, and beard and have the patch sleeves on a sports coat and, and, and khakis or, or whatever. And, he, and, and I think, you know, the old style what you visualize as a professor, you know, <laughs> sitting back and knew everything there was about life and he dressed like he didn't know how to put the right clothes on, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but the thing is, I thought, wow, that's, that's that really a pretty cool place to be at. Even though I was back excited about it. Debbie, Debbie accused me of getting a, a job in, in, in sales just so I could wear suits and ties every day. And I hate suits and ties, especially today. I don't, I'm done with suits and ties. But the thing is, is that, so I was in the restaurant. I was in Starbucks when Debbie had taken Debbie to a, a meeting on Pioneer Park. And I was in Starbucks at, at, um, on Pioneer Park. And I'm sitting there, and I'm in my, <laughs> I had my corduroy sports coat on and, and uh, a t-shirt um, and jeans, tennis shoes. And in walks these two young, mo upward-moving professionals. I'm not, I'm not picking on them other than it just, I got sat there and chuckled. Because I thought, that's the way I used to be. And now, I'm the guy back then that I wanted to be. I'm old, gray-haired, and, you know, it's like, and it's like I thought, I've arrived. I've actually arrived where I wanted to go. But back then, you know, there was times I'd see people, you know, it's like, and I've never really, I don't think I've ever had a, a super ego, but there's times where you, when you do something for so long, or you look a certain way so long, you start getting this, I, I'm better than that. I'm better than them. And in the kingdom, beloved, we can't ever have that mentality. In ministry, and again, repeat after me, I'm in ministry. I'm in ministry. Wherever, I go, Wherever I go, I'm in ministry. I'm in ministry. And so when you remind yourself that in ministry you can't have this super ego. Because it's not about you. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about what you're supposed to be doing with the kingdom in the kingdom of God. Verse 4 goes on to say, But if let each one examine his own work, and then he will have, will have rejoicing inside himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Now we're talking about burden sharing here. We're talking about burden sharing, but now we've got to bear our own load. Yeah, well, it's not your husband's responsibility to bear all your burdens. Now, do they? In a good marriage, yes. But if you're always pushing it on them and you're not taking... I should have gone the other way. It'd be safer to always work the opposite direction with that, right? <laughs> but uh, um, Rob going, he's never played it safe in his life. But like, the thing is, is that when you do that to your spouse and you expect them to take care of everything that's your responsibility, no, we do. We share. In a good marriage, you share. You share everything. You, you share the burden, you share the, you share the responsibility. But when you, one quits sharing, that's not what it's supposed to be about. And that's the same in the kingdom, beloved. We say, well, hey, pastor's supposed to text us the prayer request on Friday night. I'm <laughs> coming back to it. Pastor's supposed to protect, <laughs> per, uh, send us a prayer request on Friday night. Well, it's his responsibility. No. It's your responsibility too. <laughs> Got it in three times in one message. Um, the thing is, is that, is that we have to all share our own load. And our load in the kingdom is to be responsible for one another, bearing one another's burdens, bear, taking care, helping each of us get to the place we need. Uh, a, a gentleman by the, a Franciscan friar by the name of Michael Judd. Do you know who that was? Anybody? Michael Judd uh, was a chaplain for a fire department in New York. And he died in 9-11 saving people out of uh, burning out of the out of, out of the stuff he ended up dying in the in the collapse of the buildings himself but here's a prayer that he would pray uh, he said lord take me where you want me to go 
Let me meet who you want me to meet. Now, let's, let's just, just stop right there. If we're praying that every morning, just that first part, Lord, take me where you want me to go. Allow me to meet who you want me to meet. We're going to change our perspective on our day, aren't we? Right away. We're going to change on, okay, if I'm praying that prayer, I'm expecting God to take me where he wants me to be. I'm expecting him to allow me to meet people he wants me to meet for whatever reason. Well, I only work in a one-man shop, Pastor Bob. I'm there by myself. Well, you don't just work all day. You may get gas. You may go to the grocery store. You may do. The, there's going to be opportunities. You may go get a cup of coffee somewhere. The thing is, is that you want, whenever you're outside your home, you need to be asking God to lead you and direct you, purpose your life every day. And he goes on to say this, tell me what you want me to say. Now put words in my mouth. We talked about it in foundations. When we're in counseling sessions, sometimes you sit there and listen to them for 55 minutes out of an hour. And all of a sudden, God says, okay, now it's your turn. And, he's, and what I pray every time, I'm listening and I'm listening and listening. And I want to remember parts. So I'm listening. I'm very intent on my listening. And, 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 and I say, okay, I'm going to remember that. The Lord say, remember that. Remember that. Remember that. And then when it's my turn to get something in, I want his words coming out of my mouth. Not my biases. Not my prejudices. Not my, not my thoughts. I want him speaking through me. So tell me what you want me to say and keep me out of the way. So when we're talking to someone and we, and we believe this is who God, you know, D D Dina's in her shop and she's just in there. She's uh, maybe the, uh, the other people are on break and she's up front. She's doing the cashier. She's giving the cookies that, uh, that aren't sugar free and she's giving the, the other stuff that aren't, aren't sugar free. She's giving those out to people, you know, the one to get. Anyway, the thing is, is that she's up there with all that fine food. Now I have to remember, the other, I picked on you the other day and I apologize. Because it made it sound, because I forgot we got all this stuff going all over the place. And I, I, I don't want to ever disparage your bakery. I love your bakery. I just don't get to eat it all the time. She don't let me anymore. I can't have it. <laughs> if it was up to me, I would eat there every day. But the thing is, is that she has all this good stuff. And all of a sudden, somebody walks in and she serves them. And God says, hey, you need to say something to her. And Dina, said, Dina may say, well, what am I supposed to say? Don't worry, just open your mouth. I'll put the words there. That's what you do. Just open your mouth. I'll put the words there. I'll tell you what to say if you'll just be obedient and open your mouth. That's what he's saying here. Keep me out of the way. In other words, when you open up your mouth, keep your stuff out and allow him to speak through you. Uh, we're not called for privilege, beloved, in the kingdom. We're called for purpose. You have a purpose. You have a reason for existing. You have a reason for being here. Now, I don't know what time I've got here. Oh, i got all kinds of time. I'm doing good. Um... Because I'm, I'm, I'm teaching all this just to get to the end for a change. I, I, I have a conclusion, but I've got to get through this first. So the fourth purpose of a church is to, to give life. To give life. There are two ways we can meet any difficulty. Either we can alter the difficulty, or we can alter ourselves to meet the difficulty. Again, reminding God's dream for your life is so much bigger, so much better than breaking even. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I let you out early last week too, didn't I? So we got, I got, I, you owe me time. Just thought I'd tell you. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, we're going to look, starting to read at verse 15. And it says this, and he said to them, but do you, what, but who do you say that I am? And he's talking to Peter, he's talking to you know, talking to me, and talking to all of them. And Peter said, Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and says, And blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, now you are Peter, that's who you are. He reminded, reminded him of who he was. That gets twisted sometimes. And on this rock, I will build my church. And, the, and what's the rock? The rock is the proclamation that Peter just made of who he was. Upon that, he's going to build his church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, we're not going to get into all of that this morning. But the thing is, is that we've got to remind ourselves that he's saying there is life. I'm giving you life. I'm bringing life to a dying world. 
What you just stated, the fact of who I am, that speaks to the world that there's life coming, that life is here, and that life is going to change as of now. And everybody that was once dying and, and Haiti was gripp Hades was gripping them, they're not going to do that anymore. I'm bringing eternal life to everybody that understands what you just said. I'm bringing eternal life to everybody that pro makes the same proclamation that you made, that, that I'm the Son of God. He goes on to say, and, and, and then he goes on to say, whatever you pray. He said, I'm going to build the church on the precept, on this precept and understanding that the church is going to understand when they're ministering to people, we're ministering life. There's not one person that should ever come in the store that should ever encounter you as an individual, where you work, what you do, where you live, in your neighborhood, that doesn't understand that you have a life in you that they need. That you have a life in you that they should be hungering after. It's not that you're, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've seen, I, had, I, had, I knew people in the past in, in radical uh, ways of, pa well, Pastor Sherry. I'll just pick on her. She, she would tell you this testimony. Anyway, Pastor Sherry, before she got a hold of Word of Faith, she thought her religious responsibility was to stand out in front of abortion centers and pick it. And getting arrested was fine. None of that problem would be. be but it's not, it's not how you win the lost. You win the lost through a steady understanding that what we have is special. And when it's special, I want to share it. And it's a love that's in me that wants them to receive the same love that I've received. You know, Deb and I first got, um, when we first, when the Lord first started pricking our hearts about the things of God, we had influences in our life that would say, they go out and stand on the street corners. They stand out in front of bars. Stand out in front of liquor stores. And everybody that came out there, they didn't, they weren't saying anything but negative stuff. They said, you know, you're going to hell because of that. It's not going to hell because you drink beer. I don't advocate drinking. I never will advocate drinking because there's a whole lot of things that are problems that go with that. If you don't believe me, just talk to Rob sometime, one-on-one, -on -one, okay? The key is, well, I can handle it. Well, maybe so, maybe not. But I do know this scripture that says this, do not be drunk. And I, only, and I know this, that there's only one gauger of that phrase, and that's God. So whether I'm drunk or not, whether I think I'm drunk or not, doesn't matter. It's what God thinks. And so I cut it off right then and there. So I'm not preaching against it. I don't advocate it. So I guess I'm preaching against it because I don't advocate it. It's not going to keep you in. It's not going to keep you from going to heaven. It may cause you not to think clearly at times and reason out the things of God in the right situations. Smoking is not going to keep you out of heaven. Now those are the big things that the, that, that the religious leaders pick at of today. The churches pick at. It's not going to get you out of keep you out of heaven. It may get there faster. But it's not going to keep you out. Okay? It's not healthy for your body. Now, let's, let's step a little bit closer to home here, Bob. Overeating, if you eat like Hank and, ha and have a metabolism like me, I'd be as big as this room. <laughs> I mean, seriously, have you ever gone to lunch with him? First time I went to lunch with Hank. I didn't think she was ever going to take my order because he kept going on. And uh, he ordered, we were steak and shake, and he ordered a triple cheeseburger, specifically what he wanted on it, french fries. And then he said, oh, and then I want a chili dog with french fries. And then I want this, and it's like, I'm not picking on him because he doesn't care. He's going to eat like that anyway. He's going to, and then he gets a shake and a drink. And, a drink. <laughs> and it's like, I'm going, there's not enough room at this table just for Hank. <laughs> If I ordered like that, I would be huge. Now, Hank, he's got this great metabolism. He can eat all that, and he never gains an ounce. I don't know how. I don't know why. He gets favored like that. But someday, <laughs> I'm going to ask God. <laughs> and the thing is, is that um, when, we, when we look at those situations, we have to remember that there is a, there is, there is, there is, there is, a, if gluttony is another issue. You don't ever hear the fat preachers that preach against smoking and drinking talk about the fact that they're overweight. Well, no. Why would they? It's too close to home. You don't ever hear them talk about uh, envy. Let, let's get into the big ones here. Because dr other than drinking, smoking is not mentioned in the Bible. It does say something about keeping your body a temple of the Holy Spirit, all that kind of stuff, right? So we add that in. We fall that under that little. But when you get into the get into the ones that are mentioned, you don't hear them talk about that too much. Because probably some of that hits too close to home. 
So we pick on the things that are uh, socially awkward for the church. You know, the thing is, beloved, we have to realize that we never win anybody by preaching that kind of message. We only win them by sharing the love of God. We never change anybody's life by pointing out their deficiencies. Jesus never did that. Jesus would tell them, come here, I'm going to eat lunch with you. He'd go hang out. His, his biggest thing with the religious was he hangs out with sinners and prostitutes and all this other kind of stuff. But his ministry lasted a whole lot longer than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. His, his touch in the world, the real world, was bigger and greater than any of theirs. Because he gave them life. He presented to a lost and dying people a, a ability to live beyond tomorrow. An ability to live beyond the closing of a casket. Ability to live in kingdom of God for eternity. We, the purpose of this church, the purpose of any church, should be life. Another thing that is, number five, is, is to be division proof. Turn with me over to... Uh, yeah, let's go there. Jude. Jude. Uh, in Jude, we're going to look at verses 17 through 19. There's a couple other ones. I skipped over a couple of the other life ones because I, I want to get to the closing here. and I don't want to keep you over. Um, Jude, verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are the uh, sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. In the midst of the body of Christ, there can be no divisions. God has just continually to pound that into my heart, pound that into my brain, that in order for the church to be the glorious church, there can be no divisions. There can be no obstacles put before us. I have friends of different stripes in the ministry and I plan on expanding that beyond the ones I have. Why? Not because I want to try to get them to see things my way. I want to and I want, I'm not wanting them to. They're not going to change my way of thinking anyway. I've been doing it too long. I'm too far into this for it to be changed. But I want to see no divisions. I, especially in here. Now I want you to hear this. Um, we cannot get mad at people or circumstances. We must realize there are the where the battle's coming from. What happens with divisions? How do they start? As we get mad at somebody. We've had people leave this church and other churches have people leave the church because they got mad at somebody. And they thought, well, I can't be the way they're dividing themselves. Listen to this. But when we allow that small disagreement cause to, to, to cause division, separation, a reason to leave, then the enemy wins. You lose. Somebody leaves our church. I'm not law. I'm, I'm, I'm law. I'm, I'm at a loss, but I'm not law. I haven't lost. I believe a lot of times when they leave our church, they lose. Because a lot of times when people leave churches, they leave and don't go anywhere else. Those are the ones I'm really sad for. But I saw a couple at, at uh, several at... Uh, our conference, uh, the Awakening Conference, and I just, I'll just say her name, Anita. We all know Anita. We all loved Anita. She was, we were never a good fit for Anita. But she's at Rock Church and just ex exploding. Just, she's at Rock Church. Why? Because that's where she needed to be. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with that. But it's the ones that don't go anywhere after they leave here that bother me, that hurt me. That, but they're the ones loose. And, and listen to this. When we allow division... A little small disagreement. And, never, and most disagreements are not that big. A small disagreement that causes division, separation, reason to leave. The body corporate is weakened. I once taught a message years ago when we were in Metamora. And the essence of the message was about leaving right. Leaving correctly. And I was trying to get it. At that time, we'd had an influx of people from different churches. And I wanted to make sure that we were not art doing, getting into some artificial growth. Artificial growth, what does that mean? Is they leave one place because they're mad, and they come to your place, and they're just still mad. They're just not mad right now with you. But giving time, 
I've had people come up here after service and they've been somewhere else and they come up, not here. That's it so much that we've been in Morton. But it happened all the time in Metamore. They come up and they'd start talking, yeah, I've done this in this place, I've done that at this place, I've done that at this. And so my first question is, why aren't you still there? Well, it's da, 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 da. okay. <laughs> and I said, okay, good. It's been nice to know you because <laughs> they're not sticking around very long. I'm not saying you don't go. Like Anita, let's use her again for a good. She left, but she went where she needed to be. And she's not dis disgruntled with any of us in here. Matter of fact, when I, when I saw her, she, we, we, I hugged, we hugged each other. We, had a, we, we laughed. I, I picked on her because she amended at the wrong place in my message, the whole thing, you know, just like she would have done here. But the thing is, is that there, that's when you know it's right. And I also told her, I think in that message, if I remember correctly, years ago at Menorah, as I said, here's how you leave a church. We had a couple that we were in. We were in Metamore Church at the time, but it was the Christian church at the time. And um, they were getting in, they were in the process of getting ready to move out of state, but it was going to be like six months down the road. But they didn't like the way I, the direction I was headed the church because I was preaching full gospel message long before we got associated with Grace Ministries. And they, they came to me and said, we'd like to meet with you. And they never were disrupted in church. They were very quiet, very nice people. And they said, uh, we'd like to meet with you. Okay, so I met with them. They said, we're, we're going to leave. Uh, we're, I said, oh, you're moving. He said, no, we're not moving for about six months, but we just don't feel this is a Christian church anymore. Now, what they meant was, it wasn't that we were Satanists or anything like that. What they said was, we're, we're, you're not following the doctrines of the restoration movement. No, I, I, I was, because I really went back to their roots, but I didn't argue that point, because they came to me in such a spirit of, 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 of love and, 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 t and tenderness that that's the only way I could respond. And it's like, you know, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate your thoughtfulness. I appreciate you coming and talk to me. And I said, I'm going to pray with you so you, get, you find the exact place you need to be in Illinois till you leave. And then when you, move, when you get to Missouri, that you find the exact place you need to be there. Now, I see them on the streets. I've seen them since that time, uh, not, not, not in recent years, but I saw them after that, and it was cordial. We, we, how are you doing? What's going on? But then when people would leave with the vision in their heart, with separation in their heart and unforgiveness in their heart over a small disagreement, they'll cross the street not to walk by you. They'll, 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 find, they'll stop like this, and they'll, they'll you know, they don't have a baby in their house, but they're looking at pampers. <laughs> Because they don't want to see you. They don't want to look you in the eye. We bumped into a, a couple from that same church. Uh, we used to go to a, a, a restaurant in, in Germtown Hills. I forget what it's called. Uh, all the time. We went down there. And we walked in. And, and as we're walking in. Uh, after all the people had left the church. And left us the building. We're walking in. And, and this, young, this, this couple is walking out. This older couple is walking out. And they didn't know what to do. Because we're dead face to face with them in the doorways. And they just stood there like statues. They did not. I said, Tom, how you doing, man? And I just, I just, Betty, how are you? And they didn't know what to do. Because they didn't expect that. And one of my biggest <laughs> antagonists of that church, I saw him one time at a Dairy Queen in, in Matamora. And they did everything they could to blend into the scenery. And I thought, I'm not letting them do that. <laughs> not going to let them do that. I wanted to show them the love of God. And I went over. Come here, Aaron. I went over. And he was sitting down. But Aaron, I have Aaron stand up so you all can see it. He is sitting down and I came up from by. Hey, man, how you doing? You look so good. You, you've lost weight. You look really. Oh, and you. Oh, you look. Your hair is really nice. They didn't know what to do. Because, see, in me, there was no problem. But in them, they had allowed a small disagreement to disrupt their walk with God. They're not in church anywhere right now. That saddens me. That saddens me. So, the church is supposed to be burden, uh, division proof. Okay? Now, conclusion. Here's where I wanted to get to. These principles that we just talked about, these precepts, pillars, whatever you want to call them, I believe are, uh, are what a church is built on. Those five points, prayer, partnership, burden carrying, sharing a life-giving message, and no division. Those five things are what a church is built on. All that I've said today is to get to this last point. All that I've preached is just to get us here. 
that I believe that during this 40 days of prayer that we have to start believing and seeking God for a new location. A bigger, better location. Now, having said that, we're not moving tomorrow. <laughs> we may not be, we're, we're probably not moving, our lease is till November, so I know we're not going anywhere till November because I'm not going to pay somebody for a lease and not be here, okay? Not going to do that. The key is, is that it may be a couple of years, but we can't get there if we don't set our vision on it, okay? We can't get there unless we start putting together. Now, I have been in building programs. The Church of Matamora, those of you who had visited there when we first went there, uh, that front part where the, uh, um, if you're in the sanctuary, the, uh, where the uh, sound room was above it and all that kind of stuff, the spiral staircase was, and the offices off there, they weren't, they weren't there when I first got there. We went into a building program. Building programs suck. I don't know how to put it. Can you say that in church? I just did. If she can say crap, I can say suck, right? The thing is, is, is it's like, and the thing is, is they, they, why? Because they get everybody's little disagreement going on. Churches are not about bricks and mortar and carpet and stained glass. And it's not what it's about. It's about those five things that I just told you. But what I believe we have to do is we have to get somewhere to where we're more noticeable, to where we have more room. It's not that we're cramped. But we're not going to get any more. We're gonna get, all we're going to do is get cramped. And at that point in time, it's too late. But I'm believing God for either a piece of land, a building that's already that's already ready for us to walk in or a building that we can lease with agreement to buy but when we get when we get ready to move it's going to be our building okay now I'm, again i'm not saying next week i'm not saying next month but we have to set our sights on it we and we're not going to have no building committee committees are of the enemy <laughs> if, if you don't believe me just go to a, a school board meeting that deals with committees right Jeff you get a school board they're elected to make decisions but they make committees and then it's out of then the, 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 the Congress is like that they, they're voted in to do what they're supposed to do but they set up committees and the committees never come up with an answer they just argue we're not gonna have any committees what we're gonna do is we're gonna trust God that everything that you have dream of in a church building that would be ours will come to fullness in a process of time the right location the right structure the right setup for our, our growing, thriving yeah. ministry. Okay? And it's not about, again, please understand me, I'm not about, this is not Bob Martin, this is us, corporate Grace Fellowship. Because someday I'm not going to be here. Well, you're here, as, right, as, as, as Aaron says a lot, you're not here a lot already. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but there's going to be a day when this younger group that we've been training, they're going to take it over. Because this church is not about my lifetime. It's about till Jesus comes back. Okay? And, and, that's, and that's what we build it from the beginning. For a place till Jesus comes back. And so what we want to find is something that we can sink ourselves into. Amen? So it's, it's a vision. So start, you start dreaming with me. We'll start seeing what God brings to us. And when the right time, the right moment, it'll, it will, we'll all know it's great. This is like when we walked in this building. We knew. We all knew it was right. For the season that he had us in, we all, and, and, and what, we, what happened to it after we moved in has been amazing. People walk in, they love our building. Well, that's great, but they're going to love our new one. And we want a place that's a, a capable of growing. We want a place that in, in, in 20 years when one of these young guys are leading and Jesus hasn't returned that they, and they're, they're running 5,000 people. My ceiling is the next group's floor. Seeds we're sowing right now is so that we can, if Jesus tarries, blossom to touch all of central Illinois. Amen? And so when that happens, we're going to have to have the place to do that. Amen? <laughs> and you know what? That's fine. That's fine. You can, you, can, you, can, you can have a kitchen. You can have all that stuff. And that's the only thing the women get to talk about and choose on the colors and everything is the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Add more bathrooms. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right, well, I hope I planted in you today a message that understands what, what church is about. I know probably what I said is nothing new, 
But what it is is hopefully a refresher course in what we've got to be focusing on those five points and when we do that that building that land whatever it is we start with will be exactly what it's supposed to be for us and it's going to be a place that you know it's going to be a place that all kinds of ministry can happen to the streets to the communities to the world amen we need a place that has a place where we can grow in every aspect of the ministry okay I love you guys. You have a great week. Deb and I are in Alabama next week with our oldest granddaughter. We're excited. We're going out for a parents-grandparents meeting.